Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to Emmanuel, and this is the place to be. The flowers on the altar today are in, by Danny and Jane Caskey, in memory of Ralph and Travis Sowsley and Jeanette Watson. If you'd like to rise and join with me in the gathering prayer and adoration. People of God, let us gather to worship and praise God's name. Thanks to you, O oh God, with my whole heart, I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love for me. You have delivered my soul from the death. God says, know what I am, and will keep you wherever you go. I remember Jeff. Trusting in God's mercy, let us now acknowledge to ourselves and to each other the ways we fall short from what God intends for us, all of which God already knows, using our prayer of confession. Abba, Father, where we are in bondage to sin, set us free. Restore us as your children and joint heirs with Christ. You are our hope. Lead us in the way everlasting. Amen. At this time, I invite you to bring your personal and private confessions before the throne of grace. Lord, in your mercy, we ask that you hear our prayers. Amen. My fellow children of God, do not fear, for our God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. God's hand shall lead us and hold us fast. So be reconciled with God and at peace with one another. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, I invite you to pass the peace of Christ that has been shared with you this day amongst one another with the action and not the words of waving or acknowledging one another from the area in which you are currently in. And I'll acknowledge our online friends. Peace be with you as well. Everyone's waving at the camera that you can't see. <laughs> Please be seated. We turn now to our time of pastoral prayer, our prayer of joys and concerns, our prayers of intercession. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Creator God, thank you for making us daughters and sons, co-heirs with Christ, sisters and brothers of one another, bearing witness with the spirit that we are the children of God. We pray for the whole church that in the field of this world it may be the good seed that grows into your harvest. Creator God, thank you for making us your children. We pray for your whole creation that is waiting in eager longing to be set free from everything that holds it in bondage. Creator God, thank you for making us your children. We pray for Earth's people, its nations and leaders that all may come to know the ways that lead to peace. Creator God, thank you for making us your children. We pray for those who are ill and for those who are facing death, that they may find hope in the faith that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory to be revealed to them. Creator God, thank you for making us your children. We pray for those we know and love, that they may see the bond between them and you, and that wherever they go, you are with them. Creator God, thank you for making us your children. Blessed are you, eternal presence, who leads us to life everlasting, with the Holy Spirit and Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship this morning by singing our hymn of preparation. And notice I did say the word singing. We are going to, with a compromise, sing one verse, the first verse of, this, of each of our hymns this morning. However, we will also listen to the tune to help remind us and refresh us about that particular tune first. So Jalan this morning is going to play through the song one time, and then we will join in. The lyrics will be up on the screen, so please avoid the uh, temptation to grab one of those hymnals that you see in the pew uh, in front of you. Uh, but rather try to join together with us in song. And if you choose not to sing, that is also okay. We invite you to either hum along or to think about the words and the lyrics as you see them. This is my Father's world. Let us sing. This morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter, in which we hear the parable of weeds among the wheat. Jesus was teaching and he said, he put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? And he answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you not want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers. And they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. Here ends our scripture passage for this morning. May it be a blessing to those who hear it and to those who keep it. Amen. Please join with me in a word of prayer. Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, 
one of these days I'm gonna get the hang of this. Until then, bear with me. <laughs> Last week, we heard the parable of the sower from the Gospel of Matthew. And within that same chapter, Jesus also spoke on the parable of the weeds and the wheat. I find it funny that we're talking about weeds today when it seems that that is all that is currently growing in someone's backyard. Weeds were even of concern in Jesus' time. Perhaps that's comforting to know. Today we have chemicals and methods of preventing weeds from growing where we do not want them to grow. But the challenge is, as it was in today's parable, that you cannot truly take the weeds without affecting the growth around those weeds. The alternative is that you can go around and pick out those weeds by hand, remove them one by one by force, but ultimately we very rarely are ever able to remove the root of the weed of the problem. And so they grow back in the end. A never-ending cycle of removal and regrowth. At some point in the history of the parsonage grounds, someone planted a line of resurrection lilies in our triangular grass pointing towards the railroad tracks. Each spring, usually around Easter, those stalks shoot up and bloom, a very gorgeous flower. Then eventually they get cut off and disappear for the remainder of the year. Time and when it is not. Weeds, on the other hand, seem to be that obnoxious little brother or sister to the perennial that only knows, only shows up to choke out the other growth and grows whenever it, whatever time it simply desires. It is patient form of growth that is a persistent but oftentimes slow. If left unchecked, they will wreak havoc on your garden or within your yard. And so, unlike those resurrection lilies, which we leave alone and to their own devices, we must remove those weeds if we want order and beauty. Now, I've shared with you many times before that my understanding of farming is quite limited, and I'm so happy to see some farmers here today to correct me when I'm wrong here. But having now lived for a few years, I am better equipped with naming certain large pieces of farming equipment, largely thanks to Caleb's children's books, and I have a better understanding of what those machines do, having now watched them in the fields across the parsonage from time to time. Speaking with farmers, I've learned that there is a process for actually storing natural gases in the fields to promote growth in large swaths of, of tile laid underground in order to keep the soil richly watered or richly dried when needed. I have seen what it has been to have too much rain, or not enough rain, God. <laughs> and I've seen what happens when those come in equal amounts in times of the I have a new understanding of the idea of a time to plant and a time to consider what has been planted. However, by no means does that mean that I am ready to address or even conduct farming myself. So when I read a parable to you about weeds growing amongst the wheat, I am still woefully uninformed as to what it is that Jesus is talking about. I can understand the meaning behind it, the idea of something being sown or grown where we do not want it to be. I can understand weeds as they are annoying, and I'm usually more than happy when my wife Jen asks me to remove a rather large form of growth somewhere amongst the plants in the front or the back of the house. As I said, I'm more than happy to grab a spade or a shovel and go out there and just rip something out of the ground. But how do you yield of growth? I do not know, nor do I understand. I have seen things growing amongst cornfields or soy fields and thought to myself, now, why don't they just go out there and rip that out? It looks so unsightly, and it's not warm with the rest. But then, it is, perhaps, for the very reason that Jesus says in the parable. In gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Ah, you see, in the fields of a farm, you deal with the weeds, perhaps by not dealing with them. You leave them in order that you might not disturb the crop that you wish to promote. But when, then why is Jesus talking about weeds and a wheat field to begin with? 
Thankfully, there is an explanation offered in this particular scripture. Now, I am going to peel back the layer of the majesty and the beauty of the Bible just a little here by pointing out that Jesus may or may not have actually explained this gem of a parable. It is entirely possible that the author of Matthew offered this exchange as a personal interpretation of what Jesus was talking about, and perhaps not Jesus actually doing this himself. There are so few times that Jesus explains his parables, his lessons, to the disciples that we, in the field of biblical study, question this particular aspect of Jesus' ministry. However, we take Matthew at his word and enjoy that Jesus finally explains something, at least a little bit, as he does in this particular scripture. Especially when weeds in a wheat field, for us, might be a bit of a stretch. Jesus says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. So far, so good, right? Jesus is the sower, the field is the world in which we live, and we are the good seed sown into the ground, the children of God. Yay! The weeds, however, are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. All right, so once the world is seeded with God's good little children, then the evil one, the devil, if you will, comes along and sows children of his own, too. Boo. At the end of the age, when the harvesters come, the angels, they will come and collect everything up, separating the weeds from the wheat, the good from the bad. The bad will go into the fire and be burned, and the good will live out their time in the sunlight of God's kingdom. Yes, we have heard this all before. The separation of the sheep and the goats, those that are let into the wedding banquet, those that are not let into the banquet, so on and so forth. One day there will be a reckoning, and on that day you want to be amongst those who will be able to get into the kingdom. So this leaves us with one singular question, as it always does, which of these am I? Am I amongst the wheat? Or am I a weed? Have I been planted by God? Or am I planted by the evil one? When the harvesters come, will I be found to be saved? Or will I be lost? The answer to this question is, as always, as follows, we don't know. We can't know. We feel like we can know, certainly. We live a good life, we tithe, we care for the elderly, we care for the sick, we feed the hungry, we offer all honor and glory to God, and then even then, after all of this, we still don't know for certain. Good job, Pastor Jeremy. You leave them with little to no hope. Amen. Peace be with you. Go serve God. But there's more. It's a good thing that we can't differentiate between the weeds and the wheat in this life right now, looking around in this very room. We spend so much time, especially it seems today, vilifying those that are different than us, even for the things that are out of our control. That if we did know with certainty who was the wheat and who was a weed, we would just be adding another layer to the already widely divided world. In Jesus' time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees walked all over the place as if they were the wheat of the field, the only wheat of the field, and everyone else around them were weeds, only salvageable by the ways in which they prescribed to the people. But for many of them, there was no hope for any of the weeds in the world to truly become wheat. And that is exactly what is different about God's planted field and our understanding of farming, or my limited understanding. I told you last week that bananas can grow on apple trees in God's kingdom. And just as this can happen, so too can a weed become wheat in a field of the world. And because the weeds can become wheat, and because we don't know which is which, we are then called to live in this field in harmony with one another not plucking one another up by the roots and hoping never have to deal with the perceived weed again, but to live with those weeds in our lives in harmony for fear of damaging the good growth around those weeds. Look at the chemicals that we use to attack the growth and the weeds that we do not want growing in our yards and gardens. You start out by attacking those weeds individually. A little spray here, a little spray there, done. 
and then they come back because they're weeds, and that's what they do. They always come back. So you then spray a little bit more, and perhaps you go and you get something a little bit stronger. Talk to John Motter. That guy's got, I don't know, acid for plants. Eventually, when you get sick and tired of those weeds, you grab the Super Soaker 5000, the most deadly chemical known to all plant kind, and you go out there and you start spraying those things down like crazy. All the while, now threatening the survival of the very same growth that you're trying to protect and promote. How much more damage do we do in this world when we begin to destroy one another rather than simply live with one another? Listen to one another and find a way to coexist with one another. Yes, if only we could get that one big piece of growth out of there that we don't want, then everything would be perfect. Everything would look uniform. Everything would be beautiful. Except when you pull that one big weed out, then there's all those little ones crowding around it. So we begin to pull those out. And by the time all of those are gone, then we see another one over there. And so we grab the shovel, we grab the spade, and we start digging at the soil again. One destructive act leads to another. And believe me, right now, we have enough destruction in this world, enough threat in this world that we do not need to add to the chaotic rhetoric of weed pulling. There will always be another weed right behind it. That is the nature of weeds. So what do we then do about the weeds? Well, we be like this farmer who planted a field of good seed. We leave the weeds alone. It is not for us to harvest this field or to differentiate between the wheat and the weed. It is ours to simply be the wheat of the wheat field, to promote the growth of other wheat, to halt the uprooting when necessary in order to allow the field to heal and to prepare itself for more growth, to pray for the weeds in this world that they too might one day become wheat, become that good harvest. And then... When that day of days comes and we are all gathered in to pray that we are amongst those in the kingdom and not in the fire. That we have lived lives as the wheat of the world, which has promoted growth and not destruction. Unity and not division. Peace and love instead of conflict and hate. My brothers and sisters, I implore you, be wheat. Be leaven in the loaf, be the salt of the earth. Be a child of God. That is all and nothing more. Thanks be to God. Amen. We respond to the word of God with our statement of faith, stating boldly what it is that we believe using the Apostles' Creed. Let us rise together and say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and now we will continue with our hymn of response. The first verse, after hearing one verse, we will then sing, uh, Abide With Me.
Friends, the scriptures tell us that those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Given such a divine affirmation, let us give offering and thanksgiving at this time. And so at this time, to the word of God, with our, we respond to the word of God with our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings. If you would like to use our Give Plus app on your phone or device, please do so now. Or if you would like to, on your way out, please place your offerings into the plates in the hallway by the exit doors. Let us now take time to bless the gifts of our time, talents, and finances, praying together. Loving and ever-present God, receive the tithes and offerings, our worship and our lives, to your service. In Jesus' name, amen. And now I invite you to join with me in reciting the Emmanuel UCC Statement of Purpose. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we at Emmanuel United Church of Christ are called to be a Christian family, where spirituality means... Reflecting the joy of Christ in everything we say and do. Being responsible and generous stewards of all that God has blessed us with. And reaching out to everyone with the unconditional love of God. And with those purposes in mind, we now say farewell and send with blessing our online community. May you know the love and grace of God this week and going forward. Amen. <laughs>